हाँ पे
गौरक्षा सर गुड इवनिंग महेंद्र जी सर या गुड इवनिंग महेंद्र गणेश हेज ज्वाइन आई डोंट थिंक सो सर नो आई थिंक ज्वाइन आई विल फाइंड आउट डॉक्टर विजय गुड इवनिंग हाय महेंद्र जी हाय हाय कैसे हो थैंक यू ओके ओके गुड इवनिंग विजय गुड इवनिंग सर गुड इवनिंग विल जस्ट वेट फॉर कपल ऑफ मिनिट्स या सम पीपल माइट बी जॉइनिंग आई वांट गणेश आल्सो टू जॉइन सो एज यू सजेस्टेड दिस टाइम वी हैव गॉट मेटास्टेटिक सी ए प्रोस्टेट करेक्ट हॉर्मोन सेंसिटिव सो यू initially we will have a short presentation where you know important things you ganesh and mahendra can ask them mainly and uh, dr gita is also there so mainly about little history and uh, early management and then you can take over sure सर होल इज आंसरिंग टुडे सर हेलो सर हु विल बी आंसरिंग टुडे आई एम आंसरिंग डॉक्टर अचिंत एंड डॉक्टर अचिंत इज देयर एंड डॉक्टर अजिंक्या एंड डॉक्टर मिराज कासेकर एंड डॉक्टर मिराज आई थिंक मिराज इज नॉट येट जॉइंट बट अजिंक्या एंड डॉक्टर अजिंत अजिंत सिंह अचिंत बाजपा इज देयर यस सर I'll just uh, telephone Git uh, Ganesh. Once he joins, we can start. Ganesh bhai good evening yes good evening good evening ganesh good evening sir sir good evening hirad bhai good evening geeta sir good evening good evening sir good evening gorang sir geeta sir yes good evening good evening sir hopefully people are coming out of rajasthan uh, traumatic affair yes lots of different views are there in that i think we have to just wait and watch and what happens in maharashtra we don't know i think when if we are ready paras you are ready yes sir paras has joined make paras co host so achin and uh, ajinkya dr ajinkya yes sir. yes sir yeah so you know uh, don't answer what is given only in the books okay as a yes, answer as per this case yes sir as per the history or oh. whatever the investigation findings you are getting okay accordingly don't answer vaguely that this also can be done this can also be done what you will do that is the most important thing yes good evening sir yeah good evening uh, i am also answering sir yeah so miraj you know you don't answer very vaguely you every there are maybe two or three uh, ways of treating a patient but what you feel is right so if we ask you you answer that way okay sir 
गणेश भाई महेंद्र कैन बी स्टार्ट ओके पारे स्टार्ट हेलो हेलो so this is a case of a 72 year male uh, resident of resident of aurangabad retired government clerk admitted to our site with difficulty in passing urine since 8 month and back ache since 1 month so again this is a history now what are the important questions you want to ask sir i have to answer achin i am asking you you tell us yes sir Sir, his uh, chief complaints of difficulty in passing urine has to be elaborated in terms of uh, warding symptoms and storage symptoms. Storage symptoms being uh, frequency, urgency, nocturia, and warding symptoms being uh, poor flow, intermittency, straining, and sense of incomplete warding. Also, so that we can calculate the IPSA score and how bothersome are the symptoms. And uh, then, sir, uh, uh, we have to elaborate the backache complaint. Uh, it's pain, so it has to be related at, as per terms of uh, site onset, character, radiation, uh, aggravating and relieving factors. Then the negative history part would be any history of hematuria, lithuria, history of uh, facial puffiness, uh, exertional dyspnea, and uh, uh, and sir, uh, uh, history of fever, history of burning, maturation, dysuria. and uh, what are the drugs he is taken for the present symptoms ajinkya you want to add anything so history of any uh, history of weight loss in past eight months or anything uh, then uh, the nature Wait. of back ache like uh, what kind of back ache history of trauma and history of fall so ajinkya you tell me that these are the two different histories one is a difficulty in passing urine and second is a backache uh, what are the different correlations between these two what are the different diagnoses that comes in your mind so uh, considering individual uh, complaints so it can be related to one disease or it can be two dif different disease correct yes sir uh, considering only the uh, complaint of passing urine and at the age of the patient we could consider uh, uh, the patient could have be having difficulty passing during could be because of uh, outer obstruction uh, can be because of urinary tract infection ajin can you tell us uh, sir patient is presented with difficulty in passing urine with backache it could be due to the bladder outlet obstruction due to benign or malignant enlargement of prostate associated with cystitis or uh, it could be sir uh, uh, due to uh, uh, pyelonephritis also and sir uh, uh, it could be metastatic ca prostate also and it could be unrelated also sir considering only chief complaints we know fine dr garesh yeah. or Dr. Mandra, you want to advise them something? Some. Yes, sir. So first of all, uh, it is a difficulty of passing urine with backache. Uh, the backache means uh, many people say about the UTI, uh, about the uh, other things. So when LUTI is associated with, with the backache, there should be something neurological things should be come to come come in mind other than uh, including BPH. Because these are nothing is called uh, UTI symptoms or difficulties passing urine. So and, and also lower back ache, upper uh, back because there are nephritis. Without any uh, why other nephritis will cause uh, back ache, not the flank pain or other thing. So I think you should be very specific uh, by the history uh, when you uh, make anything uh, uh, in your mind the diagnosis. You should include everything, not only. uh the brain thing also or something with non non neurological it may be neurological thing only the backache yeah 
that's also from my side. Hello? Um, Ganesh, you want to add something? Uh, I'm, I'm I'm Dr. Patil wants to say something, add something, some any important history or something if they are missing. Okay, Paras, go ahead. Patient was apparently asymptomatic. Uh, eight months back when he started developing difficulty in passing urine with poor flow associated with straining, insidious in onset, <clears throat> and has gradually progressed with no specific aggravating and relieving factor, also associated with nocturia, two times per night, IPSS score is 17 by 35, with quality of life score being affected as 3 by 5. Patient also complained of backache, insidious and onset, progressive, aggravate by, aggravated by physical activity, relieved by taking medication. Pain is radiating to the legs. The pain has been aggravated more since last five days. And patient also complained of bilateral lower limb weakness since three days with inability to stand. Bladder bowel continence is present. So there is no history of burning, maturation, abdominal pain, fever, vomiting, immaturia, lethuria, facial puffiness, exertional breathlessness, lower limb edema, jaundice, urethral instrumentation and pass. Patient is taking analgesic for backache. Patient is a known case of hypertension is on telmasartan 40 mg he is taking in morning with a tablet compo that is risoprolol 5 mg 010 and patient under Bypass surgery in 1996 and is presently on tap because uh, family stay is nothing contributory. Patient is vegetarian by diet. Uh, bladder uh, bowel is regular. Bladder altered as described before. Sleep is disturbed due to nocturia. Habits uh, patient is non alcoholic, non smoker, non tobacco chewer. Patient is not sexually active. Okay. Uh... One question from my side, the quality of the score. So do you do in all cases or what was the uh, a special indication for doing this uh, quality score in the history? I think you can answer. So for all patients with difficulty in passing urine, when we calculate IPSA score, mm -hmm. uh, we calculate the bothersome symptoms, how bothersome symptoms are for all patients. No, the quality of life is poor because uh, this one are not. Uh, I heard last two classes. Not sorry. quality of life. Actually, uh, bothersome degree of bothersome of oh. symptoms. Yes. Okay, fine. Uh, any history of trauma? You asked trauma. It is not mentioned, but there is no history of trauma. Backache, no. You asked for what? Because there is history of backache. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Whether, whether this uh, uh, backache radiates somewhere. Because again, we have to ask the history of the, everything about the pain. It's radiating to legs, sir. To the leg. Okay. And yeah. bladder bowel all, all normal. Okay, fine. Okay. Paras, go ahead. An examination, patient is conscious, cooperative, value oriented to time, place, person. Pulse rate is 18. Eight Paras. Uh, the, uh, Paras. Paras, yes, sir. We, we will go ahead with digital rectal examination. <laughs> if, if there is no any positive finding in gender line low abdominal examination, better you go ahead with digital rectal examination. So, yeah, you, you, uh, you on, only on positive. the general examination, there is tenderness in the thoracic and the lumbar spine. Sensory examination is normal. Motor on the ankle joint and the knee joint, the power is 3 by 5. Deep tendon reflex is normal. Babinski sign is negative. Straight leg, uh, straight uh, leg raising test patient cannot perform. Uh, uh, on per rectal examination, prostate is grade two enlarged with firm to hard in consistency nodular surface. Rectal mucosa over the prostate is mobile. There is no bleeding. Fecal staining is present. Abdominal examination is grossly normal. Rest is system also normal. 
So overall, in the overall in this case, patient had a lower urinary tract symptoms, backache, mild tenderness in the spine, uh, uh, some decrease in power, and hard and nodular prostate. This patient is in front of you in in your chamber at OPD. I will investigate. So anybody can answer. Uh, I'm asking. Uh, okay, sir, I would uh, like to do urine blood uh, routine urine routine examination, and if pulses are positive, culture sensitivity, then sir, routine blood investigations in terms of CBC, uh, serum creatinine, uh, alkaline phosphatase, and sir, one uh, USG KOB, uh, and uh, one urophlometry. So you want to do ultrasonography only KOB or in general abdomen and pelvis? Abdomen and pelvis, uh, I'm suspecting metastatic. So, sir, uh, actually, MP MRI also needed. Abdomen and pelvis is needed, sir. So, yeah. what I was suspecting, uh, uh, Achin? Sir, in the 72 year male patient with backache with uh, uh, low urinary tract symptoms with uh, form to heart DRE, I'm suspecting malignancy, sir. Malignancy, mm -hmm. metastatic malignancy. Okay, fine. Okay. Okay. Is Upon the that, uh, is today. Means how is that going to help you? Uh, it gives us an idea of a uh, bulk of skeletal metastasis. Uh, uh, do you regularly and do it in your department? Regularly, so we don't do so. Uh, what do you think, uh, uh, Dr. Gita and others? Should this test be asked? I don't think there is any place as of today. In in uh, in, a, in uh, play, uh, when there are uh, a number of uh, better tests are available. True. Uh, no one is now nowadays doing the uh, test that uh, serum alkaline or acid phosphatase. <laughs> Because it only goes indirectly to the bulk of the metastasis, and that can be judged by uh, many better uh, investigations. So, uh, Achint, I believe uh, it is really not important to ask this test. Yes. So, uh, everybody, um, sir, wants to highlight this thing. If you are uh, advising any specific test, you should know how to justify that test. Okay. Just like uh, routine tests, some things are not routine. The alkaline phosphatase, CRP, and uh, these other are not a routine test. Okay? So be careful. You should know why are you asking uh, those investigations. Yes. Yeah. So, Mahendra and uh, Dr. Ganesh, uh, when you are doing uh, investigation, uh, these are important or you, we never ask for this investigation. So, no, no. Ther ther theoretically, uh, as per the literature, this investigation still is in existence. And if anybody is doing this investigation, that is not wrong. But the requirement of this investigation, when there are availability of better investigation for the same purpose, what that investigation is solving, that, that makes the question of doing it. Otherwise, if someone has done it, it is not wrong, sir. Yeah. Okay. Fine. But, sir, it is sometimes, sir, it is also comes in a, in a, uh, in a biochemical panel like LFT. If somebody does LFT, so alkaline phosphate is by default it is it, it is there. Okay. So, uh -huh. but if somebody say I, I will do specifically alkaline phosphate, then he or she must know uh, what is the implementation of that, how it can going to change the further management, or it will, it is going to help any further management. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Fine. Yeah, just show. So on urine routine microscopy, the WBCs uh, are 15 to 20 per high power field. Uh, epithelial cell are 6 to 8 per high power field. RBC are 2 to 3. On culture, there is no growth seen. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, blood investigation. Uh, the PSA was 180, ALP is 346, creatinine is 1.1, 1 .1. uh, hemoglobin is 11.6, 3 PSA was more than These are the sonography means.
uh, Ajinkya, is it or Miraj, is it possible for you to read this sonography or you just want the written report? Yes, Ajinkya, you can try. Uh, so, given uh, ultrasound then shows uh, the right kidney uh, uh, cystician and the right kidney, the left kidney is uh, the corticomedullary deficiency is well maintained. Uh, the bladder, uh, the prevoid bladder picture is showing a uh, volume of around uh, 218 cc. Post void. Postward volume of around 78 cc. So, uh, postward volume of 78 out of 218 cc. Uh, the pictures are. Okay, fine. Paras, just read the. Yeah. Paras, read it. <coughs> Prostate is enlarged. It is about 4 into 4 into 4 centimeter, 30, about 39 grams. Uh, there is a, right, a simple system on the right side. There is no. Dilatation of the upper tracts. Okay. No, no don't you're going a bit too fast. Can you hold on? Paras, unless and then it is, they ask for the examination, don't show it. So, uh, based on this, we and what is our plan? I think, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, the patient is having uh, low renal tract symptoms, and here the, the uh, post void is significant with a prostate of 40 gram. I'd also like to have a uroflow of this patient. <coughs> Paras, you can read this. And the PSA level are uh, 180, so I'd also like to have a Both this, both the students, you should not get trapped in the presence of examiner. Here, the important point is his back pain, one, and his loss of the decrease in the power of both lower limbs. So yes. that is very important thing. If you are, you know, if you are wasting your time in doing some CBT and urine routine and uh, a number of small, small investigation, so that patient will down the line will develop paraplegia and uh, the program is over. So you, have, you should be in a hurry for, for, uh, word, word, to investigate towards the diagnosis and avoiding the further complications. Sir, MPMRI with those If you are suspecting CA prostate, 180 one, one eight, one eight PSA, digital rectal examination, hard, clinically bladder, <clears> empty, <throat> power is gone down, spine, there is tenderness. So what else other diagnosis you are expecting? Why do you want MPMR? Until, until, until and otherwise. Huh. So you have to ask for some uh, assessment of local, local as well as metastasis. Mm. Your blood investigations were okay. Even uh, alkaline phosphatase is also okay. Yeah, good. Such type of cases high. are usually uh, short cases in the exam. And if you waste time in some uh, local examination and cheap, cheap complaint, then the important uh, part of the, the discussion will not, will not be there and the examiner will get irritated. Probably you should ask for a straightforward a metastatic workup, no? Exactly. Correct. In spite of asking uh, uh, some in other blood investigation, if you ask one X-ray, lumbosacral spine and X-ray pills, I'll be more happy. <coughs> On the contrary, that X-ray may have sensitivity of only 50%, but it's, at least it will give a clue to the uh, metastasis there or not. So I really don't think that sonography or anything is important here. If I were in your place, I would have said I would like to do some routine blood investigations, PSA, and once that is told with the clinical symptoms, I would go for probably a PSMA PET CT scan. And if, if they don't want directly go to the PSMA, at least they can ask some bone scan, some X-ray that will guide to the. Uh, exact, uh, probable uh, ex whatever the ex diagnosis they were expecting in their mind. Uh, back pain ke liye x-ray bara pooch sakte aap log. Ek simple x-ray to pooch sakte na. 
So Paras going give towards the Europe flow and all is absolutely unjustified at this time. Paras, show the blood is investigations and show what has been done for the spine. Paras. Paras, chala gaya lagta hai. Achint. So uh, MRI spine was done for according to orthopedic sensitivity. Okay. So, so, I think let's not waste time on this MRI. Show the report. I mean, let them not describe this MRI. Yes, yes. Regions are yes. clearly seen on this MRI on the spine. What? There is a spinal cord. Uh, yeah, you just took out that MRI. There was a spinal cord related on the upper figure. Compression on the cord. So multiple hypotense lesions noted in lumbar spine. And sick. Yeah. So, Anchit and Ajinka both for assessment of the metastasis here. If you start from examiner, may ask about X ray, examiner may ask about CT and its sensitivity, examiner may ask about MRI, what is the role of MRI in assessment of uh, a, a metastasis and PET scan. Okay, so you, you should know the answer. What is sensitivity? So, Achim, for one thing, uh, let us take one question from what sir said. Oh. What is the role of MRI in metastasis? Exactly. Please uh, MRI, sir, uh, to look for uh, uh, spinal mets. Okay. And spinal cord decompression, whether it's impending or it has already happened, sir. Okay. And? More sensitive and so specific for bony mets. Understood. Yeah. And? In See, lift notes also. Huh? What was that? Lymph nodes also can be seen. Okay. <laughs> but see, if you are talking about MRI, then you should also understand there is a full body MRI also, which can be done in a case of prostate cancer. There are some centers in the UK, they follow that rule. They do a full body MRI screening. It's called MRI bone screening. So, Achint, if it was MRI prostate with skeletal screening, okay, you could have said that. Hmm. But yeah, this is a straightforward spine MRI. No, no, okay. But the question was, ki MRI kya kya dekh sakta hai. So that Correct. is okay. But remember, then the last thing remaining and most important is MRI can still give you a full body skeletal screening. And it's absolutely accurate. MRI for bone is like 100% sensitive. Last time also Ganesh Bhai said that. No, no. But whatever. So yeah. what will you ask for now? This is an MRI of spine given to you, which shows some, some metastasis. How do you relate now? So, so, so this clearly shows it's a metastatic CA prostate. Uh -huh. uh, uh, with the X. It ka age ka tha patient ka? 72. Is 72. Okay. So, and uh, this has already shown uh, cord uh, involvement, <coughs> sir. Uh, cord compression is already there. So, so how will you treat? Cord compression. So, sir, uh, this will... Require... Na, ghuma phira ke baat karne se hai ki you how answer. will you go about now, Achin? Very clear. Ganesh bhai is sir, asking... We'll admit you... the patient. We'll give, give him steroids. <coughs> give him steroid dose of... First thing that you should say is it's an emergency, no? <laughs> ah, Clinical cord compression. We'll admit the patient. We'll give him steroids. What one steroid dose, 10 milligram dexamethasone. And then uh, every six early, uh, 4 to 10 milligram dexamethasone. And will involve a spine surgeon uh, because it needs urgent uh, uh, decompression of cord. And uh, this, and we can give one dose of. Uh, so the power is zero or power? What was the power? Two, three by five, sir. Three by, three by five. Okay. So and what can. Okay, involving spine surgeon. Spine surgeon takes away the patient for five days now. And we can give one androgen. Deprivation, uh, uh, one injection of end uh, hormone therapy, sir. Which one? Uh, Luprolide? Pomerillin? No, sir. Digor uh, GNRS antagonist, sir. And why do you, uh, versus orchidectomy, what is the better thing? Orchidectomy is a better thing, but, uh, sir, histological diagnosis is not there, sir. We haven't done the wipes. So, how can we get histological diagnosis in such a case? Next question. In the time of decompression of the spine, we can take a prostate biopsy. Uh, and? Or with, with the uh, or orthoped, the spine surgeon can also help us in taking out the metastatic lesion. We can send that for biopsy. So which is better you think now? 
Bone biopsy or prostate biopsy? Uh, which which you think a patient is under anesthesia for spine surgery? Which is better? Bone biopsy. We can simultaneously the same surgical field. We can do this. Bone which biopsy. is better? The question is something different, and you answer something different. How is it possible that examiner will be happy with you in exam? Give pointed answers. I am asking you a point question. Bone bone biopsy is a condition. Bone biopsy says. frozen section it looks like poorly differentiated carcinoma now what so we don't know na if it is from lung cancer or if it is from prostate or it is from some uh, colonic cancer it is poorly differentiated yes <clears throat> so what will be better prostatic biopsy if a bone biopsy says poorly differentiated if you are sending for histopathology obviously we will come to a prostate diagnosis with ihcs but on a frozen section there is no ihcs so you okay. should remember these things if a hard prostate is there it's not a contraindication ki spine surgery chal raha hai to prostate biopsy nahi kar sakta hai these are our own small thoughts i think we should change think properly yes so i would be in your place i would do a prostatic biopsy at the same time send for a frozen section analysis my pathologist will 100% tell me oh it's a prostatic whatever cancer they'll not tell me many things but they will tell me prostatic cancer for sure achin you said and, prostate biopsy and then you changed you shouldn't have changed uh, but exam mein aise hota hai ki you should be firm on what and you should be able to justify yes. so so which is better now orchidectomy or this patient has a power of 3 by 5 so it all comes to the mo mode of action time of action and technically the half life of testosterone yeah testosterone tell all the three things uh -huh. <laughs> what what is the mode of action of antagonist sir uh, antagonist they decrease the uh, testosterone level sir are bhai mode of action of agonist what does agonist do it causes it attaches to gnrh receptors causes the initial positive feedback the hormone increase lhfsh and it goes for a reverse inhibition and then it causes a blockade see this is agonist action what is the antagonist action it uh, attach, uh, attaches uh, it decreases the androgen receptor it attaches, attaches on the androgen receptor okay it decreases what i didn't get that gnrh antagonist that decreases the release of uh, lh lhrh antagonist decreases the release of lhrh from the anterior pituitary tract so you should say no in the pituitary there are gnrh receptors lh uh, antagonist degarelic or there is a newer one which is not in india up till now relugolix they directly inhibit the gnrh receptors the concept clear hona chahiye na isme aise andhere mein bandook nahi fire karne ka yes so complete the answer now right. sir ask you mode of action duration yeah answer main answer de raha hu secondly the next thing is the duration kitna duration mein dono ka hota action bolo for this case this is only important if you can't answer this then there is no point agonist takes sir up to 3 weeks sir Ag agonist to agonist there hai ki antagonist there hai again keep your focus at what you say antagonist in you are not teaching a theory to the examiner examiner is learned it sometime tum tumhare case ke bare mein bolo Uh, one to two days, sir. Dagger Alex. I think the people who are giving answers is a flashed on everybody's computer. Why don't you come and present the case? If these people are brave enough to present the case, then let them answer. So, Achin, yes, sir. answer whatever Doctor Ganesh has asked. He is asking antagonist. will act antagonist the... sir dagger elix one to two days sir time of it duration of it so that is also wrong answer dagger elix acts in 48 to 72 hours 
How how good is the action of test uh, orchidectomy? Within six how hours, the saturation level is reached. Itna? Within six hours. Hmm. At less than fifteen nanograms. So so what you want? Agonist uh, with three to four week, antagonist with seven to two hour, and orchidectomy with six hour. What you want? With orchidectomy. Also. See the whole sequence of asking eight minutes of questions was that he what is better probably in such cases where there is a power of two by five or three by five orchidectomy is much better. We would always do an orchidectomy probably unless he he was a just patient is dead against it or there is a patient on warfare in or there is some huge problem that we can't do an orchidectomy on this patient sometimes somebody will have lymph nodes and a very swollen scrotum with lymphedema. Orchidectomy may not be sometimes possible. The only uh, uh, thing that he was supporting his answer was saying that he didn't have biopsy uh, histopathology. So in that case, how should they go about? Because he was we already he was, discussed that. I think yeah. so. We discussed no, no, that no. be a frozen Correct. section. Orchidectomy. So, frozen, frozen. so that's what I'm saying. That he could have justified saying I'll do frozen and then orchidectomy. Yeah, that's we think. I have told him the whole thing once. Yeah. Some things you students should learn to answer in a straightforward possible way with decreasing the time you waste in your exam. If this is the way you give exam, you have 35 minutes probably or 40 minutes. You are never going to complete. This, this actually was a the history was very classical that there is a spinal cord compression happening. Mm. This is one of the rare, uh, what you could say, an oncological emergency. So I would agree with Dr. Bakshi. Your answer straight out should have been that I would do something for the diagnosis. I would look at the uh, MRI. But probably <laughs> that you would be looking at the MRI is to look at whether there is an extra dural component. What is the structural integrity of the uh, spine? Because if there is no structural, many of the institute would also consider doing RT. But if there is no structural integrity of the spine, then doing RT is useless. If there is structural integrity of the spine is there and if there is only a component, then RT also comes into play. And I would agree with Dr. Bakshi here. Doing an orchidectomy gives you the fastest relief. In fact, within a quarter of a day, uh, would, would have been, uh, you get the relief. Fine. I think now you made everything very clear that when such a case comes in exam, how they have to approach. So Ganesh, just go ahead now. Or Dr. V.A., you can go ahead. Uh, you can uh, go ahead. Go ahead I think you should have asked for a PSMA PET scan probably. Okay. So Dr. Vijay and I both will take it. Vijay, please be okay. there and ask questions, whatever you want. You are an examiner today. Okay. So this patient, you you wanted to do, uh, uh, let's say that you did an orchidectomy. Then what? And let's say you do an orchidectomy and you see that the power increases, but it's stuck at 4 by 5. The spine surgeon says that, okay, uh, I'm not very sure. If you look at this, is spinal con. Uh, canal stenosis at L3, L4, second into arthropathy and uh, compression by a paracentral disc belt. He says, okay, I, I may consider, it may not consider. You did an orchidectomy, the power improves to 4 by 5. But after that, it is stuck. What will you do next? What I'm trying to ask you is that once you do orchidectomy, 6 hours, how many hours do you think that it would take for a if let's say there was an extra dural mass for it to decrease in size. So we know that the levels of the testosterone or it would go down within few hours. How many days it takes for the uh, shrinkage to happen? Achin. Uh, I don't know, sir. Listen, listen question carefully. Here, the MRI shows uh, for compression also. Okay. Yes. And emergency arcadectomy has been done already. So along with emergency arcadectomy, is, is there any another treatment you can add, add using the 
orthopedician. Yes. Decompression. So the, the both the treatment will act combinedly and the problem gets solved. Dr. Gita has already given a hint. In this situation, you don't see a much of extradural or a intradural mass which is there. So what uh, uh, Dr. Sultana was trying to hint you, yes, if it doesn't revert back completely, you would actually go with, with a decompression of, that's already done. And decompression and stabilization of the spine, which needs to be done in this case. In fact, when you are planning this case, the, one of the reasons why you would do an MRI is to look at whether there's a mass which is causing it or whether the structural integrity which is causing it. If the structural integrity is compromised, the spine surgeon is involved right from the word go along with this because it is not going to get controlled just by a decrease in this. So let's say that this structure, this is done. Uh, so what is what else can you see on this uh, X-ray apart from the uh, that there is a this done? What else is very striking in this X-ray? What else is very striking in this X-ray? So, scoliosis is there, kyphosis is there, sir. And there is Do you think the patient is osteoporotic? Uh, osteoporosis is there, yes, generalized osteoporosis of the vertebra. Yes, no. Do you think he is osteoporotic? Yes, no. Yes, sir. So, what will you consider for something like bone health? Yeah. This cost me some. The supplements to post operatively can start. We can start with the uh, bisphosphonates, sir. So, directly uh, start with bisphosphonates, or still patient is admitted with you, you do some checks and then start. So what Dr. Point. Bakshi is asking you, what are the two things you will do before starting uh, bisphosphonates? bisphosphonates? Two yes. investigations. Bone scan, sir. Sorry? Bone scan, sir. Okay. Why would you do bone scan? That's cool. How much is it in giving bisphosphonates? How is bisphosphonates metabolized? Who destroys bisphosphonates? Kidneys. Renal Kidney. This is a 72 year old male. I thought he had a history of CAPT also in the past. So there is a likelihood that his kidney functions may not be that great. What should be the creatine clearance for giving full dose of bisphosphonates? More than 60 creatine clearance. Correct. You need to get more. Which second test would you do or examination would you do before giving bisphosphonates? Would you want to see the teeth of the patient? Os you do Os a dental checkup. You will do a dental checkup. Na? When you give bisphosphonates, in future you have risk of osteoradio necrosis of the jaw or osteonecrosis, let's not say radio, osteonecrosis of the jaw to, uh, uh, so that uh, the jaw, so you will always do a dental checkup and if there are any teeth which are decayed or would require procedures like root canal, you will actually do that, wait for four weeks and then do, do bisphosphonates. Okay. What is the dose of bisphosphonates? In this situation, for osteoporosis, I'm asking. It's 4 mg in 100 ml normal saline over 15 minutes. What is the frequency? Yearly, sir. Six. Correct. It is six monthly. When you go it for uh, osteoporosis, it is given every six monthly. One side effects of bisphosphonate, which happens very frequently, and most of the patients will complain. Hypocalcemia. No, not hypocalcemia, beta. Most of the patients will have the hypocalcemia patient. Correct. Uh, someone is answering that most of the patients will complain of fever, myalgia, and fever after giving bisphosphonates. So you need to always advise them after giving bisphosphonates, especially zolendronic, that uh, you may have myalgia and fever. So you need to take paracetamol for that. Let's say that the this patient is affording and he says that I want to use denosumab. Any difference between the efficacy of denosumab versus zolentronic? Denosumab is more effective. Not well, they both have similar effectiveness. 
it is given subcute and it doesn't cause that myalgia. So not much difference between their denosumab most of the times is costly, but if effectiveness wise, not much a difference. Okay. Anything else? Now you have done onchidectomy for the patient, you have done zolendronic for the patient. Anything else you want to do for this patient? With this kind of x-ray for bone health, anything else? Want to do vitamin D levels, calcium, want to supplement? Yes, sir. Calcium and vitamin D, sir. Yeah, you would want, na, with this kind of osteoporosis, now do a, giving a bone modifying agent, calcium reabsorption would start. You want to supplement with vitamin D and uh, calcium levels. Yes. When do you want to call these patients? Let's say you do all this, the power improves by 5 by 5. When do you want to call this patient again? Let's say patient gets discharged, you admitted, you did an urgent prosthetic biopsy, you did an urgent MRI. Next day, the patient was taken by the spine surgeon. The same day, you did a uh, orchidectomy. That's what Dr. Gita was trying to tell you. This was an emergency. You should have uh, got... A, so if, if 48 hours or 72 hours are lost on the power, it doesn't recover. So that was, that was the urgency in this case to do all these things. You did all that. Uh, and let's say on the seventh day, the patient gets discharged. What do, when would you call the patient? Ajinkya sir is asking for both, for the progress of the disease or the regression of the disease and the clinical outcome. Normally, how many days do you call the patient in the first follow-up? Seven days. Answer what to do in routine, routine time. Orchidectomy for suture removal, local site. We, we do after seven days. So when will you want to call the patient? Let's see the PSA is showing the slide also. PSA of the patient is, uh, Gleason score is how much for this patient? Four plus five, sir. Oh, it is four plus five, na? Yes, so nearly yes, nine? Or uh, Yes, sir. Okay. How would you say this? This this is a metastatic prostate cancer, and you have we have uh, uh, this PSMA PET is. Do you have the report of PSMA PET also here? Or, what further you like to do for this patient? Yeah, in this case, now actually we, they had done it outside, so they had yeah. not done actually a PSMA PET scan, but they had done a FDG. Okay. So now, please, uh, you know, explain us the regarding the difference between these two and which one is better and whether it is going to make any difference. Vijay, okay. So looking at this report of PSMA PET, uh, doctor, let's get go one step back. Why do you want to do a PSMA PET, not do a FDG PET? And if I'm correct, this patient has got an FDG pet. What are the diff what are the why why Dr. Bakshi was so specific that let's get a PSMA pet? Why not an FDG pet? PSMA pet has more sensitivity, sir, than FDG pet. And okay, it, so you you feel that PSMA pet is more sensitive. So let me ask you a question. If there are 100 patients in whom I do a FDG pet. And in all those hundred, I do a PSMA PET also. How many extra lesions in how many patients extra lesions are caught by, by a PSMA PET? PSMA for in terms of malignancy of prostate. Sir. Huh, in, in, in prostate cancer, beta, in prostate cancer, hundred patients, I do a FDG PET. In all those hundred patients, I do a PSMA PET. How many patients I <laughs> upstage like i would actually catch more lesions or more something in how many patients it's around 10 to 15 percent in 10 to 15 percent absolute numbers you would actually catch more lesions and it is very sensitive what you said is correct so again a question can it happen that you do a psma pet but a lesion doesn't take a uptake Yes, 
Yes. Yeah, it can happen. It can happen that even even it happens rarely, but it can happen that a PSM fit doesn't take a uptake also. Okay, but it, that situation is very rare. So looking at this, seventy-two year old male spinal, you have got a Gleason's of a score of nine, and you have that skull bone, scapula, sternum, rib, vertebra, sacrum, ilium, as well. Let people. What you would say is that it's it's a high risk or a low risk? High risk. Okay, so how do you define high risk in metastatic prostate cancer? What are the different types of definitions which are there? High risk is sir uh, uh, more than equal to four bony mets. Okay, so what you are telling is charted studies definition more than or four bony mets. Any qualifications? With at least one. one of them as yes, please tell me, Sultana. With at least one of them outside the pelvis and outside the vertebrae, correct. And uh, plus uh, with one met. Or, with, yes. Correct. So charted says that four bony mets, one outside the pelvis or the vertebrae, or patient has visceral mets. That's the charted definition. Anyone knows the latitude studies definition? So it actually took into account saying that the Gleason of more than eight. It also took into account that if yes, three or more the three or eight, more bony mets were there, that also be taken into the latitude. Anyone knows the Stampede's definition of a high risk? Stampede actually in this study when they conducted, they didn't define high risk. They nearly took everyone who had metastasis disease at upfront as high risk, but. In general, the definition, which is generally most accepted, is four or more, or presence of visceral mets. Okay, so let's say that this is a seventy-two-year-old male. You have done orchidectomy, and you have this. What next would you want to do? Uh, we should. Uh, it's a high-risk case, sir. Uh, we should evaluate the patient, uh, and we should start chemotherapy for it. Okay, so you want to start chemotherapy for for, for this patient. Yes. Which chemotherapy you want to give? Docetaxel, sir. Okay, you want to give docetaxel. Okay, so seventy-two uh, year hai, CABG hai. Any other comorbidities this patient had? Hypertension. Hypertension, and with this amount of bony mets, uh, I have. The fitness might be an issue. Let's say that you 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 feel that the fitness might be an issue. We discussed in MDT, he says that okay, not sure that this patient may tolerate docetaxel or not. Then what would you do? A beratron with surge. You can exactly. you can use abiratron. Abiratron. How? What is the mode of action of abiratron? Or mechanism of action? How does it act? CYP seventy. Steroid uh, uh, synthesis. Abiraton. 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 In the tumor and in the adrenals, what it decreases the production of testosterone in the tumor and in the adrenals. Correct, correct. So it, it does that. Okay. Before starting abiratron, which are the electrolytes you you are concerned about? Potassium and sodium, Why? because it will increase the mineral corticoid level and which correct. cause very good. Very good, very good. What is the dose? Thousand mg, sir. One with food, one without one. food. With. With. Uh, with. Sorry. With food, without food. Without food, sir. Without food. What happens if we give it with food? Decrease in absorption. Decrease or increase? No, no sir. So let's say that my patient doesn't have money. I want to give half dose. So I would give it with food or without food. So abiratron 
has a specific action that when you give it food, it actually leads to an increase in the levels of abitone in the plasma. And that's why when, if you want to give low dose, you go with the low fatty intake, fatty food, so that it leads to increased absorption. And you can get away with the dose as low as 250 mg as opposed to as 1000 mg. There are some phase two studies which have shown that that may have action. Okay, how do you want to follow up this patient? Let's say that you started abitron and you started, so let's say that patient was not fit for docetaxel. So you started, gave the, uh, you gave the, uh, you did orchidectomy and you added abitron. And then when do you want to follow this patient? With serum PSA. Okay, how many days it takes for the PSA to fall? How does any tumor marker fall? Five times. So, how much time Five half life. Correct. You say you normally four and a half half life. So, what is the half life of PSA? See, you must know the half life of PSA, LDH. Beta HCG, alpha fetoprotein on the tips of your uh, of your tongue uh, or your hand, let's say. Fata for Dana This is very basic. What is the unit of PSA? Nanogram per ml. Good. Nanogram per ml. Do you know the unit of beta HCG, LDH, and alpha fetoprotein? So this also is a very favorite examiner's question, sir. Huh? So you just remember the units of all these three other <coughs> things. Also. Okay. So let's say that the PSA starts falling. Okay. How often will you do the PSA now? Every three months. Four so let's say you did the PSA after one month. Okay. It was 180. It came down to 60. Now, when do you, and he says, okay, I'm fine. I don't have any back pain. I'm, I'm doing well. Okay. Um, when do you want to call the patient next? What should be the frequency of follow-up of these patients? How are you routinely kitne time mein bulate OPD mein? When do you call it routinely in the OPD? I think, yeah. Uh, three months. Yeah, yeah, answer me. That is fair enough. Most of the institutes will follow two to three months of uh, uh, routine follow-up or when the patient has symptoms, he can come anytime. When would you do, would you do uh, radiological imaging again? Let's say a PSMA pet after three months or every follow-up for this patient. Yes. You are saying not. yes or you are saying no? If the PSA is rising, then... Correct. In routine doing imaging, as we have very little evidence that it benefits the patient. So it would be reflex. It would be reflex subject to, to a rise in PSA or a rise in symptoms of the patient. Okay. So anyone, let's say the patient is on follow-up with PSA. So what would trigger you to suggest that there is a PSA failure? If at least 25% of PSA rises there every week or, uh, or, or four weeks. So you want to, from, you want to specify anything from which, which, yeah. Let's say that the PSA went to uh, let me give you a practical example. In this, it went to 90, then 60, then 30, then it was around 10. And let's say it was around 10 for one year. Okay. Then it became 12. Yes. Then 13, then 14, then 15. In subsequent, now once it became 12, 13, you're calling at 111. Just to make sure that uh, it became 13, 14, 15. So wh what, when would you trigger that, okay, this is increased PSA? Three consecutive rises. Sorry? Three consecutive so what rises. I'm trying to ask you is, I'm trying to ask you the definition of PSA failure. 
And Anjit, you are telling right. Tell. In this. Uh, as per the ASTRO definition, sir, three consecutive rise of PSAs consecutively. Correct. Correct. So, does the definition of PSA failure differs according, let's say, uh, what would be it uh, the for uh, academic sake? Uh, you should know the definition of PSA failure after prostatectomy, after doing RT plus hormonal therapy, after this. All in all three situations, the definitions differ, the values differ. So, you need to know this also on the tip of your tongues. Okay. So, let's say the PSA went to 20 and you again did a PSMA bet, but it, it doesn't show anything else. That the picture remains the same. That only this side of lesions are there, no sclerosis, but the PSA has increased. And the patient is absolutely asymptomatic. Huh? PSA says, oh, I have problem, nahi hai, but your PSA is hai. What would you do? We'll check the testosterone levels. You want to do a testosterone. This way, we have done the orthotectomy. What do we do with the testosterone level? We look for lesions which are, if they are increasing in size, if it is only a biochemical failure yes. or uh, radiological. Uh, Correct. All so, very good. Very good. So, this, this the, what the picture I was describing you is only of a biochemical failure, not of a radiological failure. So what would you do when there's on only a biochemical failure? We can add uh, enzalutamide or abiratron to the patient. Okay, but we have already added an abiratron beta. Na? So in this yeah. case, because this was high risk, but we considered that this was not fit for docetaxel, which in all probabilities with the 72 years who had had a power of 3 by 5 and with CABG would be with higher. Yeah. So we have already, already added abitron. So we have given, yeah. So in this situation, what would you do? We can add enzalutamide to this patient. So, so you want to add enzalutamide in a patient who has <laughs> already administered abitron. What are the chances that the patient who is already exposed to abitron would respond to enzalutamide? It's okay if you don't know the percentage. It is less or it is more? It is more, sir. Um, if, okay, I'll give you situ three situations. One, patient has received only, let's say, orchidectomy. Okay? And he has a PSA progression, you add enzalutamide. Situation one, listen to the question. Huh? Situation one. Situation two, he was fit for docetaxel. We gave orchidectomy and gave docetaxel. And now there's a biochemical failure. Now you want to give enzalutamide. Situation three, orchidectomy done, Abitron given, and now you want to use enzalutamide. Of all these three situations, which is the place where you think enzalutamide will act the best? It will act the best on after orchidectomy. The next best after orchidectomy plus docetaxel, the least in orchidectomy plus abitron. And this is what the data which we got from the enzymate study. Okay, so not it, you can add it, but not very uh, good option. Let's come back a bit more. Okay, let's say that this patient says, um, I, I, I am only a biochemical failure. I have a very good PSMA pettis, then we have a very good P, uh, PSMA expression. Patient says, I am not sure. We already have ruled out uh, that. Docetaxel couldn't be given one year back because his condition was not that good. Any other radiological or nuclear medicine intervention which can be done in a patient who has only biochemical failure uh, and you think that he is not a candidate for a chemotherapy, has received a ADT plus abitron. In fact, this patient, because he's 72, who has undergone CABG, he, he also had a quite a few medications and we will come back to that after 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 some time. But any other thing, radio, uh, 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 nuclear medicine procedure? Lutein therapy, samarium therapy, sir. Strontium. Tell me, you will do samarium, you will do anything else? Radium 220. Sorry? Radium 223, you will do it. India, mein milta hai radium. 
इंडिया में कौन सा हो सकता है लुटियम विच, विच, लुटियम तो पीएसए में लुटेशन थेरेपी हो सकती है यस सर ओके सो दिस इज स्पेसिफिक सिचुएशन ना इफ समवन कैन गो बैक टू द मेडिकेशन दिस पेशेंट ऑन ऑन आई थिंक ही वाज ऑन इक्वोस्पिरिन एंड ऑल आल्सो फॉर दिस पेशेंट यस सो इन दैट इन सच पेशेंट्स ना इवन Giving abrotron many a times becomes difficult because of electrolyte imbalance and creatinine issues, huh? So if I was in your place, I would have possibly chosen enzalutamide in this patient if he was not fit for docetaxel. Okay. So let's go back to this case again. Let's say this is not seventy-two. This is a fifty-two-year-old man, absolutely fit, no comorbidities. Now what do you want to do? Orchidectomy is done. He was. ऑलकेडेक्टमी हो गया चलो लेट्स टेक ऑलकेडेक्टमी इज डन 52 ईयर मेल एब्सोल्युटली फिट हाई रिस्क डिजीज व्हाट नेक्स्ट यू वांट टू डू डोसिटेक्सिल ओके यू वांट टू ऐड डोसिटेक्सिल यू वांट टू ऐड एनीथिंग एल्स विद द एंड्रोजन ब्लॉकेज और और कंटिन्यू सुनाई नहीं दे रहा जोन से बोलोगे बेटा नथिंग सर नथिंग डोसिटेक्सिल एनीथिंग एल्स डू यू वांट टू ऐड You had given or done orchidectomy, given docetaxel and add abrotron, all three together. Yes. Why yes? Any studies or anything you can quote to justify your yes? Alta studies and card study uses a combination. Card study. Okay, no issue. So I'll explain to you. There are three studies which have been done. Okay, in which actually standard of care. One study actually studies whether we can add darlatumide. One study studies whether we can add abrotron. One study studied with whether we can add enzalutamide. The problem was the standard of care kept changing when the studies were recruiting. And so many of these patients also received docetaxel, and hence we could do that analysis also of ADT plus docetaxel plus darlatumide or plus abrotron or plus enzalutamide. In all these three studies, in patients who were fit, it was found that this was having an advantage in overall survival to the tune of fifteen percent, one point. And not only that, it also led to a decrease in chances of disease progression. Question is, what were the side effects? Do you think when you do three drugs together, the side effects will be less or more? Oh. Less. More. More. Oga na logically na you are giving chemotherapy, you are giving. Uh, Uh, this ye uh, uh, and uh, uh, abrotron and uh, lhrh it will be more so the side effects are the tune of around 60 to 70 percent severe side effects and hence you need to choose your patients properly for such kinds of therapies okay yes. okay one more question and then then we can go to the presentation it's already uh, 10 10 now okay so If you have a choice, let's say the patient, like orchidectomy has been done, you have to add docetaxel or add abrotron or add enzalutamide. Let's say in this patient he was not fit, you had the choice of adding abrotron versus enzalutamide. What are the factors you would take into consideration? Ki abrotron add karu, ki enzalutamide add karu. If there are no uh, meds. then we can add abiraterone only if biochemically is high if there are presence of meds about so, dosana i am talking about this situation at baseline aapne orchidectomy ek din pehle kar di hai isko high risk disease hai you want to add something is not fit for docetaxel 72 year so, so what am i to how would you decide that i would add enzalutamide or i would add abiraterone for high risk sir abiraterone why not enzalutamide Alutamide because meds are present. Sir. Okay, okay. So actually, you can add any of them. 
the choice would depend upon the patient ka comorbidities okay so like if the patient has a history of seizures or neurological issues you won't like to add enzalutamide enzalutamide predisposes the patient to seizures okay. if the patient has issues which which are related to drugs multiple times they are taking taking which which may be like causing creatinine derangement changes in potassium you won't want to add abitron these are the simple things which you see in day to day practice which would help you to select a drug there is no head to head data between both of them okay so we don't know the comparison uh, bakshi sir we should we move on with the presentation or yes yes i think let's move on to the presentation yeah yeah so yes, what i'll do is i'll take step by step i have discussed most of these issues and i'll explain you right. what we could do and how step by step we can go in such situation so So, so I think if you stop sharing, oh sorry, you finish off that case. Ka kya hua and then yeah. you stop sharing. Yes. Is the screen visible, sir? Yes. Okay, so we will start. So this is what we were discussing of, uh, and this is something which you all must know that. we can do a surgical or castration or a medical castration and this hypothalamus pituitary and testicular axis should be known to you that gnrh gets secreted it stimulates pituitary fsh lh gets secreted it stimulates the leydig cells you have testosterone coming out and it has inhibitory effect both both places now what we must know is that there is this positive and negative feedback system the stimulus of the pituitary is subject to the pulsatile release of gnrh if you have a continuous secretion of gnrh then the pituitary won't secrete lh and fsh and that is what we take into consideration when we give gnrh agonist can i explain you in detail when we come there now why do we give adt adt is very good it is one of the earliest discovered i would say targeted therapy it normalized psa in 90% of the people you get response rate in 90% of the people and you get improvement in quality of life within 3 to 5 days so you never underestimate the power of adt it is very good now which adt you can give now we had this discussion about gnrh agonist understand this is a synthetic agonist now we had this natural agonist here which comes to the pituitary these are synthetic with synthetic they have few peculiar properties they have a very high receptor affinity the degradation is slow because they don't get degraded with enzymes and they are 100 times more potent so when this gnrh agonist are given they actually lead to stop this pulsatile release and lead to continuous release because of the continuous release the testosterone initially in the first 14 to 20 days would actually increase and then decrease and it it stops decreasing when you have the desensitization of the receptor affinity so you could see that there is a initial rise in testosterone it takes one week for downgrading of the gnrh receptors and three to four weeks for the decrease in testosterone level and because of this rise in testosterone you can have a flare phenomena and this is an appropriate case when actually if you had an extra dural mass or you have a mass which can cause any visceral crisis this should not be considered as an option because flare phenomenon is there you have multiple formulations commonly we use luperaloid you can use dosing of 1 month 3 month 6 months formulations are for uh, i am commonly but you now have a subcut formulation of 6 months luperaloid and you have an intranasal spray of bucerilin also and those who don't remember the different it can be easily remembered by the mnemonic lgbt okay so lgbt yaad rakh loge so you know that the formulations of gnrh agonist your target is to get the uh, testosterone to the castration level which is around 1.7 nanomole per liter or commonly the way we record below 50 nanogram per dl now is there evidence that this is as good as olkerectomy in long run is it in long run it does show that is it is as good as olkerectomy now Let's look at antagonist. Now, antagonist mainly we use degaralis, which is available. We Dr. Bakshi also told you about the other type of antagonist 
which are there in India. And this have got compared. And what you could see here, and which is interesting for, for you to note here is, because the separation is achieved within nearly 98% with a dose of 240 by 80. And that's the reason why we use this dose, dosing in the practice. And at three days after starting treatment, the testosterone levels falls below in, in, in nearly 96% of patients with degaryllix. And that's what Dr. Bakshi was alluding to, like it takes 72 hours. And even the PSA levels comes back with, with this therapy. Now, what are the salient findings when you compare this, all the three treatment groups, whether you want to compare the orchidectomy, LH, RH, or A. The Degar LX, understand that you need to dose monthly. It is subcute, and hence it causes a lot of in injection side reaction to the tune of around 40% as opposed to luprolide. There are certain benefits which we see with respect to Degar ellipse, and this is like uh, multiple times it has been said that uh, uh, there are meta analysis which show that it causes some less amount of side effects. Peculiarly, we have talked about the less about side effects being cardiovascular side effects. So, if a patient has a cardiovascular comorbidity, it seems to be an option, but that issue is not completely settled. So, in overall, it seems that all three. Orchidectomy, Degar LH, LHRA Jagunis, overall in long term are similar. You choose one depending upon individualization of the patient. Like if you have immediate action, orchidectomy is there. Of action two to three days is okay. If you want, Degar LH is there. Want to, don't have a flare phenomena, orchidectomy or LHRA Jagunis antagonist. If there is no issue with the flare phenomena, then LHRA Jagunis also is a good option in this situation. So, the, the thing is, any of these three you can use, and there is actually not much of a difference between long-term actions in this, except that injection side reactions are more with GnRH antagonist, and cardiovascular side effects are less with uh, GnRH antagonist. So that is the way you choose between these three ADT. Question is, when do you start ADT? So do you get a metastatic CA prostate, you immediately start ADT? So if you have a metastatic disease, which is high volume or high risk, yes. Sometimes you may get a patient who has, you have done a, let's say, a prostatectomy, and he has a biochemical recurrence. And you would see that there is some one bone mats which is showing up. Uh, and uh, you think that it's a, it's a low volume disease. Uh, this uh, recurrence has happened after two years or three years. Gleason score also is less. This patient, you may hold on to your guns for starting, starting therapies. But in general, in metastatic disease with high volume disease or multiple bone mats, it's recommended to start therapy early. And why is that? We have meta analysis. Done, which shows that in hormone sensitive prostate cancers in this metastatic state, if you start them early, there is a benefit with respect to overall survival. There is a benefit with respect to the disease free survival. Skeletal events also decrease and adverse events do increase with immediate start of year, but the benefit overweighs the risk of the modest increase in adverse events and there is not much impact on quality of life also. So up till now, we said you can choose any one of these three, LHRH, uh, GNRH agonist, GNRH antagonist, or orchidectomy. It needs to be individualized decision. Preferably start early, which we would do, except in rare cases in which it is very low volume disease and life expectancy of the patient is very limited. Now duration. Do you want to give it for continuous or you want to give it intermittent? Continuous means orchidectomy is continuous. LHRH agonist or antagonist, you are keep giving it, keep giving it for lifelong. You don't stop it, huh? even if the patient progresses. Androgen depression therapy continues. So it continues for lifelong for this patient. Or you want to give it for intermittent androgen deprivation. Now, intermittent androgen deprivation is actually a very uh, attractive concept. If you look at it, it will decrease the adverse event because you are not giving continuous androgen. So fatigue, cardiovascular events will come down. 
because this event comes down, quality of life of the patient should improve. This is a theoretically advantage also. When you give continuous androgen deprivation, the cancer actually becomes androgen independent. So if you give it for some time and then remove it, there's a theoretical possibility that androgen independent will take time to occur. Now, how would you do it if you say that, okay, I would want to give uh, intermittent androgen depression. Two ways of doing it. You can have a fixed time. Let's say that four to six months, I will give androgen deprivation and then I will stop. I would have then follow up the patient at periodically one to two months. And I would, I would share the slides with you all. So don't worry, just listen. Okay. And uh, I would restart at a predefined PS11, which can be either 10 or 20 or if radiological PDF. This is one way of doing it. Second way is maximum response in which you start with androgen deprivation. You don't know when you are going to hold it. You say that when you reach a PSA Nadir, which means let's say the PSA falls from 180 to 90, 90 to 60, 60 to 30, 30 to 10, and it's stabilizing at 10 for one follow-up at least. And after that, you stop it with wrong. And then you keep a criteria again that, okay, it comes to 20, then I will restart or if there's a radiological pain. This is the way it has been done in most of the trials, intermittent androgen deprivation. Now, do we have evidence for intermittent androgen deprivation? This was a huge randomized study done in, and got published in 2013. What it shows us, this was actually a non-infinity study where they wanted to show that giving intermittent androgen deprivation should be non-inferior to continuous. Actually, you could see that it failed the non-infinity limit. This non-infinity limit was 1.2, which means all these bars should have been below inside 1.2. Then you would have claimed non-infinity. You could see that all of the crossing. So it failed non-infinity. You could see that logically speaking, median survival was 5.8 and 5.1. So approximately the benefit was around only of seven months and which if you are very, uh, sound, you could say that it was restricted to 8 to 10 percent of the patients. So the question comes in this study, did actually the side effects decrease? Unfortunately, in this study, it didn't demonstrate that there was no significant difference in side effects rate between the two groups. But there is a catch. Now, let me explain you what is the catch. Normally, in studies, what you say is, if I have 100 patients in one group and 100 patients in another group, what I compare is the number of patients who have side effects. Like for example, dono group mein agar aap androgen depression to hoonge, dono group mein kuch side effects to honge. Okay. You don't compare the time spent in side effects between the two groups. You understood what I say, said. For example, a group mein grade 3 or 4 side effects, let's say 40% logo ko hoa. But you have continuous de rete, ये ग्रेड थ्री और फोर साइड इफेक्ट हुआ 200 दिन के लिए या 300 दिन के लिए ये 200 दिन 300 दिन कैप्चर कभी नहीं होता है व्हाट गेट्स कैप्चर्ड इज 40 टू 60 परसेंट को हुआ दैट में भी साइड इफेक्ट फॉर वन डे और में फॉर मल्टीपल डेज दैट इज व्हाट गेट्स कैप्चर्ड एज अ क्वेश्चन अनदर ग्रुप यू हैड साइड इफेक्ट्स इन 40 टू 50 परसेंट बट द ड्यूरेशन ऑफ द साइड इफेक्ट्स वाज ओनली फॉर 50 डेज बिकॉज़ इट वाज इंटरमिटेंट अंडरस्टूड to stop in so this doesn't get reflected and that's the reason why this uh, this this uh, this there was no difference in the study what it is interestingly did show that erectile dysfunctions and libido was preserved only for three to nine months even in the intermittent group after that it was lost even in that group now eortc i am a faculty of the eortc study group also and we actually today itself in the afternoon the next pragmatic trial of ERTC is going to be planned and the EMA has received funding for that is actually going to be this one. Continuous versus intermittent because they feel that the time spent in, in side effects is more important than just the amount of side effects which you have and the end point is going to be that. But till that, at present, the conclusion is that in metastatic setting, continuous is better than intermittent. You can go for intermittent, but then you need to explain to the patient that it may not be as good as continuous. There's another study which was published in European Urology, and it actually showed that intermittent is not inferior to, it is not inferior to continuous. What you must remember, this is true for 
T3, T4 because 9, 89% of the patient in the studies had T3 or T4 disease. Only 11% had metastatic disease. So this actually doesn't become relevant to, to our discussion today. It becomes relevant when you are treating a T3, T4 with, with RT or with prostate and as such, there we, there we give only for short duration maximum of three years. Okay, are we on the same page? You can stop me anytime, anywhere if you're not understanding. Huh? So what is the consensus today? Is we can give anything between bilateral uh, orchidectomy, electronic agonist, electronic antagonist. Preferably, we'll start early, except in few very selected patients. We would give continuous today because the evidence is in favor of continuous. The next question is, what we need to do to prevent side effects of these patients? We must understand that when you give androgen deprivation, the bone turnover increases. And it decreases the bone mineral density and hence it subjects the patient to bone fractures. So these patients should have supplementation with calcium and vitamin D. Along with that, you need to tell them lifestyle modification, like you need to do weight bearing exercises. Many of these are elderly, so they actually go for walks, but that is actually not going to help them. You need weight bearing exercises and decrease alcohol consumption and smoking. It's always a good idea if you're going to you start here, set a bone mineral density. For this patient, you didn't have to do a bone mineral density in that x-ray it was very clear that it was osteoporotic. Get a bone mineral density. If the Z-score is below minus 2.5 or between 1.5 to 2.5, then it's better you consider giving a bone modifying agent. And in this situation, it is given six monthly for two years. Okay. So, uh, any questions on ADT up till now? Okay. You can ask anytime. You can put it in the chat box and we can take it after the game. So, we used to do only ADT. ADT used to, to work well, but in ADT, we used to lose the patient after a few years. After a few years, recurrence or progression was actually a norm. Very few patients could continue on ADT. So, and uh, so what would you do in that? So, let's, the first thing which came development was for docetax. We have three trials up till now. The GETUG trial, the charted style, and the tampered style. All use docetaxel. You could see the dose is 75 milligram per meter square, given three weeks. Most of the trials have used six cycles. And GUTEC used nine cycles. Now, let's have a look at what was the differences in this trial. And this is important. You could see both GUTEC and charted actually enrolled metastatic prostate cancer. Stamped actually went to one step ahead. It actually also enrolled T4 disease. So high risk advanced also were enrolled. You could see that a good number of patients got enrolled on these studies. Here it is nearly 400. Here it is nearly 700, 800 near. Here it is nearly 1000. Okay. And you could see that a good amount of patient had high glycine scores which got enrolled in the study. Now, without going into each of the study details, we'll try to see what the Cochrane has to say about this. They say that, okay, definitely the data shows that it leads to an overall survival benefit. Hazard ratio is 0.7 means we have 23% decrement in the risk of death by giving, adding docetaxel to androgen depression. It does increase three times the risk of side effects. So you have to be careful about selection of your portion. It also decreases the chances of disease coming back in these patients. And interestingly, they didn't find any difference in the quality of life of these patients. Now, the question comes, who benefits? And this is what the definition which I was asking you, which where you most of the you agreed with the charted definition. This is the latitude definition, of which also include, decreases the bone lesions to three, lesion of eight or more, or presence of visceral meds if it is there. This is the stampede definition. Stampede actually took any metastatic disease was considered as high risk. And this again becomes important because the next few trials you'd see that suddenly things have shifted in that direction. So what are we seeing here in this, in this situation? And I have shown you the curves of stampede. And what it shows you is that when you give uh, for oral survival, and this is the graph for oral survival, when you give ADT with docetaxel, you would see that uh, 
many of the patients do well till 72 is actually six years. You can have 50 to 60 percent of your patients going up to six years and beyond. So this is something which you could achieve in this situation. But six nowadays, understand that we're trying to improve on the outcomes. Elderly are increasing, but they're more fitter now. So we're trying to improve on these outcomes. So how would you improve more? And someone actually answered in the chat box. This was the peace study. Now, peace study was an interesting study. It is not asking the question of ADT docetaxel plus something. And I'll explain you this. It is asking, do you know you have seen custom sensitive to prostate cancer? So any patient who is DNO is taken in this study. All are requiring continuous ADT, huh? And they're stratified according to dosage excel received or not received, versus other type of stratification. The randomization is twofold. It's actually what we call as two by two factorial design, in which you have two interventions which have been studied here. One is ab abetron and radiotherapy. When you were do you do a two by two factorial design, your basic assumption is that the two questions you are asking should not be interrelated to each other and they should not interact with each other. The hypothesis here is abiton and radiotherapy won't interact with each other. Okay, and so the question is whether adding or abiton to standard of care improves outcome, whether adding radiotherapy to standard of care improves outcome. We will focus on the question whether adding abiton to standard of care improves outcome. Interesting thing is the study is equipped from 13 to 2018. What we are saying is in 13, the standard of care is ADT alone. This is a very pragmatic study. It keeps on changing. You see, then it becomes ADT plus docetaxel. Now, what happens is, because of this, you have a variable standard of care in this whole trial because this protocol kept on amending as obviously as it would have been ethical for them to do. When you look at all population, standard of care versus abiton, there's is definitely a benefit. So you can see the radiological progression free survival improved from two years to four years. We are a doubling of radiological progression free survival with the addition of abitron. You could also see at five years, 30% patients were progression free, which improved to around 50%, 45% you would say, with addition. So which means 15% absolute improvement in radiological progression free survival with the addition of abitron. And this benefit was also seen in patients who had high volume disease because they selected all patients. I told you, Dean Ovabiliata. So it is not a high volume. They had taken all patients. So this benefit is seen in high volume disease also. And when you compare this with the results, ADT alone, you could see survival 30 months. ADT by dosage excel survival 40 months. Abitron added with ADT, survival is 50 months. But when you add ADT, dosage, and then the survival jumps in the range of 60 months. So from 30 months, steadily, we have improved to 60 months, nearly doubling of outcomes. Now, who did addition on lead to increase in side effects? Yes, it did. 63% versus 52%. So 11% increase. But abitron still was safe. Why I tell you? The, the increment is largely because Abiton has mineral particle action, so it led to an increment in hypertension. You remember, I told you for this patient, I want a chosen abiton because he was already in hypertensive, already a CABG patient, already received ecospirin. Those things have to be kept in mind when you're prescribing these drugs. It leads, it did not lead. What I'm afraid, I'm afraid of fibrinal neutropenia. I'm afraid of a lot of fatigue in this patient. This was not increased with abiton. Okay. So, what is the conclusion of peace plan? Addition with docetaxel or standard of care leads to improvement in outcomes. It was improved in both low volume and high volume both. The improvement was absolutely in terms of 15% improvement at 5 years and radiological progression doubling from 2 years to 4 years. Yes, increase in side effects, but that is largely because of increase in hypertension. Okay? Now, let's go to another study, the Enzymet study. This also is very similar design. You could see they are again taking both high and low volume. So, any metastatic CA prostate is taken. Again, the control arm is the standard of care arm. 
versus addition of enzalutamide. Again, during this study also, the standard of care kept on changing. And then that's why they have put early docetaxel, yes or no. And what we see here is, again, this, if you look at five-year survival, jumps from 57 to 67. Absolute 10% improvement in five-year survival is achieved by adding enzalutamide. Does it benefit all patients? And you could see whether you receive docetaxel, whether you have high volume disease or low volume disease, it actually benefits all patients and zalutamide. Does it lead to an increase in side effects? Now, if you look at the increase in side effects here, it is actually minimal increase in side effects with enzalutamide. The, you could see fibrile neutropenia 6% versus 6%. 1% versus 6%, hypertension also not increased. What it does is it causes neurological kind of side effects like memory impairment, seizures, which are seen to the tune of, of 8 to 10%. And that's why if your neurological history, avoid enzalutamide. If your cardiovascular history, avoid abiton. That's the way you choose when you sit in your clinic. Now, Darla 2 might. This is the third study which has been done. I am not talking in detail because I don't think this drug is available in India. And But this is one of the most safest drugs. You see, there is an increase in chances of improvement in survival by 10% nearly. It decreases the chances of developing time to castration prostate cancer. Someone's putting in the WhatsApp group. You could see at 36 months, 30% have become castration resistance as opposed to here, 70% have not. So, you know, 40% decrease in the chances of becoming castration resistant. You look at side effects, they are nearly the same, 42 versus 44.8. So, yes, if you get this drug tomorrow, this for me will jump enzalutamide and abletron as my drug of choice because of its good safety profile. Okay. But today, this is not available. So, my choice is restricted. If I want to use a three-drug combination to androgen depression, docetaxel and this. So now the question comes and the key question is prostate is seen in elderly patients. A three drug regimen sounds very nice on paper. It sounds nice on studies. Understand when you do studies, you select your patients very carefully. They are under the guidance of multiple trial coordinators and the PIs and they are very much supervised. This doesn't happen in routine practice. So for me, you would select a patient for triple duct therapy if he's very fit, doesn't have uncontrolled comorbidities, has normal function, and because most of them are advanced, I would always do a comprehensive geriatric assessment in this patients. And how does that help? In multiple studies, I have shown that doing comprehensive geriatric assessments help for these patients. You can actually doing a comprehensive geriatric assessment, put these patients in three categories. One is the blue category marked in blue category, that is negative CGA, which means this comprehensive genetic assessment takes time. It takes three hours. You evaluate every system in this. If it is negative, you can treat him as fully fit. With doing comprehensive genetic assessment, you are actually trying to assess the functional age of this patient, the life expectancy of this patient, and also the risk with chemotherapy also come with a score called TARC score. If it is obvious frail, then you don't are not going to subject to three drug therapies. If he falls in this yellow, which is vulnerable, so in CGA, you come to know what are the vulnerabilities. Doing physiotherapy, during doing nutrition, you can actually overcome these vulnerabilities. And if you overcome them, do a repeat CGA, and if they are fit, you can start. So let's say that if a patient is completely fit with ADT, you will start all two together. Frail, don't bother, only ADT. If it's vulnerable, you can start with ablatron. Assess after two to three months whether with, with the recommendations from the comprehensive genetic clinic, if the patient has become fit, you can actually start it after within three months also. This is what actually was done in the trials also. It was allowed to start the other things within three months. Now, genetic oncology clinics are rare. Uh, we had in Tata, we have one in Hinduja. And it takes, it, it's a team, it's a team of physiotherapists, psychologists, nurse, nutritionists who takes, it takes around two to three hours of extensive assessment in this. And that helps you to give a tailored uh, regimen. So what would be the way I would follow an algorithm? A patient with comprehensive geriatric assessment negative, which means it's completely fit. 
is functionally like a young patient. Whether it has high or low volume disease, today the evidence is in favor of ADT, docetaxel, and addition of one of these ingredients. If this DGA shows vulnerability, I would actually add ADT with one of a abetone or enzalutamide, and then assess the patient again after three months following the recommendation. If the patient is CGA frail, which means the patient's performance is not good, uncontrolled comorbidities is there, or PS is not good, I would only give ADT in this patient. How would you do a response assessment for these patients? It's done every three to six months. So three months when uh, Sultana answered, that's why I said, yes, you can do it. Imaging should actually be reflex. There is very limited evidence that doing repeated PSMA pads, uh, repeated CT scans, all bone scans actually helps in this patient. They actually only lead to more radiation exposure in this patients. A word of caution. Normally, whenever we have meds in lung cancer or breast cancer, we are trigger happy to start zolendronic acid or denosumab as bone modifying agents. We have a negative studies in castration sensitive prostate cancer. The studies for positive in castration resistant prostate cancer, you can see both curves are together. So there is no need to give zolendronic acid or denosumab for patients who have bone meds. You need to give it if the patient's BMD is less or patient has osteoporosis. And the dose here in both places is different. If you want to give it for bone meds, you need to give it monthly. When you give it for osteoporosis, you need to give it three monthly. So today, a metastatic disease, a high volume Harris disease, if fit, all three together, if unfit, individualization, ADT alone, or ADT with epitron or enzalutamide should be the options. And geriatric clinic is one thing which you can do in, in such things. With that, if you have any questions, uh, I try to keep it clips and as far as possible as algorithmic so that you can understand. I'll just share the slides with Dr. Bakshi so that he can share it in your groups. If you have any questions you asked, I restricted this time with the permission of uh, Gorang sir that I won't take cash and resistance because that is completely another 45 minutes lecture which I would prefer to talk at some other point so that I can explain you what things need to be do, do in that. So if yeah. anything, let's yeah. Uh, yeah. ask any question, I'll stop sharing. Uh, yeah. Just, yeah. As per your uh, uh, advice, we are next uh, Tuesday, we are taking uh, uh, hormone resistance or castrate resistance. Uh, I'll yeah. present next Tuesday, sir. No issue. Yeah. No, no. yeah. Second thing, uh, there was one question uh, that if the patient has got a bone pain with a metastasis, so in that case, we should only try uh, first ADT and see whether it is improving or not. Or I didn't get the question, to... sir. No, if, the patient, if the patient has got a bone pain with a metastasis and okay. uh, newly diagnosed. Okay. So yeah. if the patient we only start ADT and see whether pain is uh, disappearing or not, or immediately start uh, other treatment also. So, so normally, sir, I would actually, uh, if the patient has bone pain and metastasis, I would start the patient on ADT and assess the patient's fitness, whether he is fit for undergoing the other additional drugs. I would, if the patient is completely fit, is absolutely fit, fit, which which is unlikely if the patient has lot of uh, meds and pain. In that, I would at least add abetone or enzalutamide. If the patient is completely fit, I would add dosing. Okay. The question in high volume metas is abetone preferred over docetaxel? No. Actually, at present, ADT plus docetaxel, ADT plus abetone, or ADT plus enzalutamide have not been compared against one uh, other each other. What we have is, we have comparisons of ADT docetaxel versus ADT, ADT abitone versus ADT, ADT enzalutamide versus ADT. In all these three, these three are better. We have comparisons where ADT plus docetaxel plus abitone, ADT plus docetaxel plus A. What you're asking is a very good question. Well, 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 whether we can give ADT plus abitone versus ADT plus docetaxel, Unlikely that question would someone would be taking now, now that it has been shown that ADT docetaxel plus abitron is better than ADT abitron. So that seems to be an unlikely question that would get answered in the recent times. Now. It would need an investigator trial. I don't think the 
for ebrt yes surely ebrt we have stampede data we have fees data also that ebrt after 3 to 6 months in patients who start benefiting adding actually helps in this patient yeah any uh, i think any student has got any other question i think vijay thank you so much for being with us today karo bachpai ko question puchna hai puch lo puch lo sir usse to humne question puche usko bhi question puchne ka mauka milna chahiye sir ha sir wo one stupid question sir ha no nothing is stupid can ask all orthodectomy and abiraterone and enzalutamide all are and androgen deprivation therapy acting with the same mechanism sir so it is not actually like that the the points of actions are actually different so if you look at uh, gnrh a what we are doing is we are stopping lh fsh we are stopping the testosterone release but still peripheral convergence of testosterone and peripheral formation of testosterone does happen when we give this abit and enzalutamide we stop that also okay so they are complementary it also has been shown in in vivo studies by taking we do psa level in the in the blood uh, in the research setting they do psa in the tissue level also and it has been shown that that also decreases when you add this two together then should uh, can we use testosterone level as a biomarker because sir, one way i told to you told already so already no I not told. see so now whenever we look for biomarker now biomarker normally whenever we choose uh, for cancer directed uh, therapies should be the one which is secreted by the tumor because your interest is whether the tumor is going down or not okay testosterone as a biomarker is for whether our treatment is suppressing it or not so you use testosterone when the the tumor is not uh, uh, benefiting let's say i start adt abiraterone and uh, and it is lhrh agonist i'm trying but the patient is not responding or the psa is not falling that time i say oh well, let me check whether the castration levels are achieved or not achieved that is the time you will look for testosterone level but to your question there is actually a study i am forgetting the name of the study which had shown that the nar if the testosterone level we say 50 nanogram per dl but within one year if that level goes below 20 nanograms and if it is suppressed below 20 nanograms for a longer period of time they actually do much better than patients whose whose levels were above 20 nanograms per level but we don't have a, and this is a what to say exploratory analysis we don't have any evidence to suggest that a deeper level of suppressions below the castration levels which you talk about actually benefits or not okay okay There is okay. a question on neoadjuvant ADT in locally advanced non-metastatic CA prostate. Yes, neoadjuvant ADT in non-metastatic CA prostate can be given for anywhere between four to six months. It it can be given uh, coupled with RT radiotherapy. Uh, so what sir has answered is correct. So you can oh, that's why I said it can be given. It doesn't mean you have to give it. So. Your case when you have a locally advanced prostate needs to be get discussed in a multidisciplinary clinic. Let's say your prostate is very large. In fact, last week only I came across such a case with the posterior wall of the prostate is indenting the rectum and the fat planes with rectum are lost. Now your radiation oncologist is not going to be very comfortable radiating in this prostate. Okay, all the prostate is so large that it has reached the lateral wall. Then he is not going to be comfortable radiating in this prostate. so in such situations you could give neoadjuvant adt and then decrease the bulk and then subject it for uh, radiation okay the one last question uh, is there any role of bicalutamide in recent uh, sir i think the role of bicalutamide today is when you give an lhr agonist for the first 14 to 20 days so that the flare does not happen that's where i use bicalutamide Okay, so initial fourteen fifteen days we can use bicalutamide. Yes, yes, yes. What will be the dose? It will be fifty milligram once a day, or it will be three times a day. Sir, I normally give fifty milligram once a day only, sir. Okay. Bakshi sir. So along with GnRH agonist, it is fifty milligram once a day for three to four weeks to suppress the initial flare phenomenon. Okay. 
And Fine. So again, yeah, you can use some bicalutamide when the patient is, you know, deciding what option of ADT with respect to orchidectomy or medical castration you want, she or she wants, and hmm. they are buying time from with you, hmm. or they have okay. done. Or sometimes a patient comes with a PSA which is 100 plus 200, 300, and they don't have neurological deficit. So you would send for a PSA map at CT scan, biopsy, whatever, whatever. So once hmm. they do biopsy till the report comes and you are going to do PSMA and institute treatment, you can hmm. again give bicalutamide. Other than that, as a standard of care in metastatic CSPC, that is what Dr. Vijay Patil said. Now, bicalutamide is technically given up. Correct. Because we have more potent androgen receptor inhibitors. Hmm. Any other question? Somebody might ask the students, so what is the difference between bicalutamide and enzalutamide? Bicalutamide blocks only the endogen receptors, whereas enzalutamide blocks the epigenetic receptors as well as the uh, DNA activation, so intracellular effect. I think Dr. Vijay said he's the best to answer this. What's location? Yeah, what your answer is correct. It also is more potent and resistance to degradation by enzymes. Okay, so last the one more question that this uh, for the bone pain per se, jolidonic acid is not uh, to be given. Na? For bone pains, if the patient is castration sensitive prostate cancer and if the BMD is okay, actually there is uh, not no benefit of uh, which has been shown in studies. So that doesn't decrease the pain, doesn't improve quality of life, doesn't decrease the skeletal related events. So if you if there's osteoporosis along with that, then it can be given or else as a routine no, sir. Okay, okay. And about bone pain, no. There is a standard answer what we tell the student. So if it is a newly diagnosed case, we start with ADT. Ideally, even as per many studies and even guidelines today mention that do a bone mineral density. If you, because we don't have routine x-rays to see osteoporosis. Then if there is osteoporosis, start calcium, vitamin D and give, uh, do a dental checkup check GFR and give bisphosphonate in the orthopedic dose. This is Dr. Vijay oh. Orthopedic. Genosumab I... can be used as per the affordability. Fine. I think I, uh, Dr. Prof. Vijay... Was you start the other treatment, bone pain will reduce. If, however, not reduced and PSMA pet shows some spot which is still remaining to be painful, then I think palliative radiation to that spot can be considered. But you give enough time for the ADT, then use analgesics, you give bisphosphonates, calcium, vitamin D, and then think about radiation, palliative radiation in the end. Okay, okay. Hmm. I so, think most of the questions are answered, but we have so got... Uh, uh, Ganesh, we have got a next Tuesday also. So students or, you know, we can also go into detail and if any question is left, next time also we can ask him. Uh, and sir, if MCRPC is the next time topic, then I think let us invite Dr. Vijay Patil sir right now for next time. No, already, already told him, na? Hmm. We have yeah, decided that we are going to have a session only. Hello, thank you Vijay. Thank you so much for being with us. Excellent, excellent. So many doubts are clear and it's so beautifully you explained. Now this is recorded. So the students will keep on listening to it and I am sure that it, many of them will be benefited just before exams. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, thanks. Thank, thank you, Bhagan sir, Ganesh bhai, Mahindra bhai, Gita sir, Gaurav sir, good night. Good night, Good night. Okay. Okay. Bye, Ganesh. Thanks. All students, well done.
Golden Achim, Sultana. Good night. Okay, good night, sir. Good night, everybody. Good night. Bye. Bye.